This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time, and we have a very interesting and a very comprehensive view this afternoon. We're going to uh, be joined by Dr. Chris Friesen, and uh, he's going to talk to us about a variety of different things, including uh, how you can plan to become who you want to be, uh, how you can actually measure things with your mind and brain, and how some of those tools that uh, informed practitioners, neuropsychologists do in terms of measurement and, and actual practical matters. So welcome, Chris. Nice to have you on board. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, thanks for having me. You have a great show here, so I'm happy to be on the show. It's good. So what I'm going to do is just say a couple of words about the people who are helping us be on today. First of all, a brief word about uh, direct health access. You listeners already know how much we love the reality of data here at CBJ. And today we're welcoming our clinical friend and our new sponsor partner, Direct Health Access Laboratory. With over 3 million studies, they are deep leaders of experience with the big picture of measuring, for example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges. Global service with a molecular focus. Stay tuned. We're looking forward to working with them. And then we also have locally here, uh, you listeners also know that we appreciate detailed improvements of mind care, and we have a local sponsor who is a residential care facility. So this particular group is the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center, Barry Robinson Center right here uh, in Norfolk. They have an adolescent and child uh, residential treatment facility that's nationally and internationally recognized. They've been in business only for 80 years. And what they do is they provide residential care on an evolved family and interpersonal level. So they're interpersonal, but global. More about them later. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Chris and we'll get started. Dr. Friesen is a PhD, a C-Psych. You need to tell us about what that is. Originally from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and is now located in the Niagara region up there. He is a psychologist who's, a psychologist who's always been fascinated by what makes people successful. He's a licensed clinical forensic and neuropsychologist, more about that in a minute, and now he helps primarily works with professional, national Olympic, and up-and-coming elite athletes. We're looking forward to hearing about that, as well as other high achievers such as professionals, entrepreneurs, executives, academics, writers, achieve their personal and professional Potential. That is a mouthful. He's a busy guy. <laughs> so he's currently director of the Friesen Sport and Performance Psychology uh, website and a contributor to success.com. We're going to have his connections down in the show notes. You're going to really enjoy. It's been great fun getting ready and seeing what he's doing. He's very, very busy. And he's the author of Achieve, Find Out Who You Are and What You Really Want and How to Make It Happen. Those are very good words. You think about the utilitarian value of that title. It's unbelievable. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself that we haven't covered here, what you're up to, what you're doing, what you really like to do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like you said, I'm in the Niagara region in uh, Ontario, Canada. Um, I used to play hockey when I was a goalie when I was young. Um, I have a uh, soon-to-be five-year-old daughter. And uh, my wife's also a psychologist who specializes in eating disorders. Um, and I love science fiction. I love biographies. These are sort of the non-clinical uh, <laughs> or professional aspects of my life. So, um, and a big part of what I also do is uh, neuropsychology work as well, uh, not always with athletes, with clinical populations. Um, uh, the other website I have is called niagaraneuropsychology.com. Uh, so that's another big part of what I spend my time doing. 
Well, Chris, and as a matter of fact, I saw that. I saw both sites, and I actually mm. hooked you up in the show notes. I've already rewritten, the, pre-written the show notes, so, mm. and I hooked up the Niagara Psychology Clinic as well. So great, great, right on it. So let's get started. I mean, there are a couple of things we could talk about. I think the first thing to do is is let's talk about your recent book. Let's talk mm. about people going somewhere, identifying who they are, how they can get there. Some of the things that we've really found out that that are useful and structurally helpful as opposed to deep psychotherapy, what's your Oedipus complex like? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so the, the book is really um, a combination of uh, ex- experience I've had with working with high achievers, my, a little bit of my own life experience, and of course what the research suggests. And it really uh, to, to find out who you are, what you really want, and how to make it happen, uh, my perception is a lot of self-help books that are out there start um, you know, too far away. They start to, uh, or, or too microscopic. They start in the you know, setting goals. And in my book, setting goals is really near the end. Uh, it really starts off getting to know, the first step is getting to know your, your core personality. Uh, these are based on uh, something called the five-factor model or the big five personality dimensions that um, actually the DSM-5 is now using that as a uh, supplement dimensional model of personality or uh, personality pathology Uh, but this is in personality research uh, this has been known for at least 70 years now that there are if you take any measure uh, MMPI PAI any of the personality measures not the Rorschach but other measures you basically when you do some fancy statistics to it called factor analysis you really come up with five global dimensions of personality which briefly are uh, susceptibility to negative emotions and stress. That's what I call it. The literature calls it neuroticism. Uh, so you can be either high on this or low on this, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, extroversion and introversion. These are, again, a, conti- uh, a dimensional continuum. Um, and uh, we all know what that means to an extent. Uh, some of the information that's out there in other books is a little bit misleading. Extroversion um, uh, sorry, introversion is really more of an absence of extroversion. It doesn't include other things like introspection and that kind of thing, uh, which some books suggest. That's really part of another uh, of the dimensions called openness to experience. Uh, the other two are um, conscientiousness, which I call motivation and self-control, which is basically uh, where someone stands in terms of their uh, their motivation and their their discipline, their that kind of thing, their or, organizational um, tendencies, and agreeableness is really an interpersonal attitudinal dimension, which is uh, basically how our attitudes towards others, whether we're sort of competitive, uh, trusting or not trusting that sort of thing. So I think the very first step, because these have biological underpinnings, about 50%, so five zero percent of our personality is genetically inherited. We know this from twin studies, twins raised apart, et cetera. Uh, the, the other 50% is obviously to do with our environment, but we're not very good at measuring exactly in the environment what causes this. Uh, so there's, there is biological and neurological underpinnings for these, and they're not easily changed. Uh, they're not unchangeable. They're just very difficult to change. And unless it's a major problem for you, you, you probably don't want to try to change it too much because it's, it's an uphill battle. Uh, to make an introvert an extrovert or an extrovert an introvert is actually quite difficult to do. Unless it's caused by something else. You know, some people can be uh, introverted because of social anxiety, which is actually not the same as introversion. Introversion is not related to anxiety, which is part of uh, anxiety is part of negative emotions and stress or neuroticism. Uh, These are orthogonal dimensions, which means that they're not correlated. So your standing on one is not related to your standing on another. So long story short, the, the, the first thing I believe people need to know is what is their core personality? You know, what is their biological underpinnings? And then it really comes down to figuring out your values, uh, some of your strengths, uh, uh, some of your, and then from there coming up with a mission, um, like a mission statement, for example. And only then should you start to really start to set goals, long-term goals, short-term goals. And the very last chapter is really about how do I put this all into action on a day-to-day basis from understanding willpower uh, to, you know, whether you should be using a to-do list. So that's really uh, the book in a nutshell. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. You know, I got, I got to tell you, we're on the same path. I didn't know this as you, you as you really. I didn't have a chance to read the book, so I'm listening to this, and I've I've always been interested in personality myself because it's sort of that 
ne'er-do-well guy hanging out there that don't, nobody can do anything with. It's just a label. And, hey, that's what you're going to be with the rest of your life. You got a personality disorder. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Call And, and you, you see this in meetings. You know, somebody's talking about, well, hey, you can't do anything with him. They don't say it that way. Yep. But they say, well, he's got a personality disorder. And then, of course, the psychoanalyst would jump on that. And I'm a recovering psychoanalyst. I don't know if you knew that. I <laughs> took I seven, seven additional years on that one. So, and, and in those meetings, you say, well, hey, you know, he's got a touch of resistance going on. You know, he's stuck somewhere back in some past situation that we're just going to have to give him seven years of analysis. And, <laughs> and maybe it'll come out. So what you're saying is there are some really important cognitive things we can do. And to just uh, tell you a little bit more, as I, I wrote a book in, back in 92, a long time ago, called Deep Recovery, How to Use Your Most Difficult Relationships to Find Out Who You Are. Mm. <laughs> and I was using the self-awareness from a relationship perspective. You know, uh, uh, faulty relationships that didn't work out, that you wanted to work out that you could say, okay, what were my goals? What did I want from this relationship? What, what, how did I contribute to it not working out? What was I doing that was uh, not as effective as, as it needed to be in this? It's really just increasing self-awareness yes. and saying, look, personality, uh, personality patterns are correctable. And I, I really like the introduction you had there about the fact that they're biologically mediated. You know, you're going to enjoy, and I know our listeners will too, Going back to listen to Dr. William Walsh on 025, mm. because his whole thing, and when you get deeply into Walsh, a lot of what he talks about all the way down to autism, which, of course, is not a personality disorder, but, but goes in the direction of, hey, it's incurable. Uh, you know, then you start to look at those biologic underpinnings that can actually have, and I've seen this in my own office, personality attributes that seem like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Certainly they're beyond medication. So that, that's really interesting. Now, how do you actually apply these concepts with individuals that you're consulting with? I got the timeline a little bit. Where do you see the most difficulty in the next transition of awareness? Once they say, okay, here's some underpinnings, where do I go with it? Where do you see the resistances and the troubles coming in that next step for the most part? Well, I think um, one of the first things to do is really to come to a decision in a way to accept parts of your personality as just the way you are. So, so there's a bit of a distinction between a personality disorder and where you stand on these, what I'm describing are normal personality dimensions or traits. So we all mm-hmm. fall along a continuum of these extreme uh, scores on some of these are, are highly correlated with personality disorders. But I really think that people need to, let's just say, for example, you are introverted by nature. Um, and this is, you've always been this way. It's not because of anxiety. It's not because you're shy, because you can work on anxiety and overcome that. Uh, and, but if you're but if your uh, goals or values or mission is to, you know, spread the word about something across the globe and go and give talks and you're very introverted, well, uh, it's good to know that about yourself because you're, you know, susceptible to burnout. If you're, it's really uh, extroversion, introversion really has to do with external stimulation tolerance, uh, whether it's social, whether it's just environmental in the sense of living in a, a big city in the downtown versus living in the country. So if you know where you stand and sometimes, uh, and there's a really big push in this in the psychotherapy research, the third wave of behavior therapy, for example, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is getting lots and lots of new uh, data supporting this, and of course, this is related to mindfulness, is acceptance. It's sort of accepting the way you are and then finding out what your goals and values are and, and, and just working towards that. But if, you're, if your goal is to really be in front of people, then you know maybe you should work on that and you can work on your introversion to try to be extroverted, but at least knowing that compared to, let's say, someone who's extroverted, you're going to need time to uh, be alone. So if your job all day is meeting and greeting with people, as an introvert, you're going to need to go home and recharge. Uh, vice versa, if you're an extrovert in your job, uh, involves sitting in a library by yourself or doing research for hours on your own, uh, you know, at, at home, you're going to have to do some exciting, uh, often socially stimulating activities. So I really think uh, accepting 
you know, parts of you that are really difficult to change and only changing them if you feel it is necessary. But I really believe that all, all of these traits have in our society. We don't want a uniculture. I don't believe that everyone should be, uh, have no negative emotions and be extroverted and open and agreeable. That's actually not good for society. There's a reason uh, biologically or genetically or uh, evolutionarily why we have all these uh, uh, variations within the population because they were all adaptive. So just a quick example, mm -hmm. someone who's really high on negative emotions, uh, back when we were living you know, on the savanna as a tribe, those people were very helpful because they could predict, sometimes over-predict, uh, negative things that might happen. You know, They may see someone from another tribe and think this person's dangerous or we shouldn't take this uh, long trek, what if we run out of food? Whereas the people who had very low anxiety, if everyone was like that, then the tribe would have made a lot of mistakes and you can make that argument for every one of these dimensions so mm -hmm. they're all adaptive it's really if it matches your environment and i really don't think there's a need to change it unless uh it's really getting in, in the way of your goals uh but there's usually a way around it the one exception is the negative emotion side this can really hold people back at times but mm -hmm. this is something that most mm -hmm. athletes for example come to see me they say listen i want to be uh i'm going to the olympics and i feel really anxious i don't want to feel anxiety and maybe they're they have a personality tendency to be to experience a lot of negative emotions um, and one of the things is to, to remind them that of course you're gonna feel nervous at the Olympics that's expected that's normal uh, and also peak performance actually occurs when you do have anxiety. It doesn't occur when you have no anxiety, and it doesn't occur when you have close to panic anxiety. It's called the yerkes dotson law. This means that peak performance, no matter, almost no matter what uh, situation, whether it's powerlifting or whether it's chess, occurs at a moderate level of arousal. Uh, of course, the, the curve is pushed to the left or to the right, depending if it's powerlifting or chess, but the you, there's, you actually want some negative emotions. And another example is actors, writers, uh, lots of artists, they tend to have high levels of uh, negative emotions as a personality trait or dimension. And this is good because you need to tap into those feelings to produce art, to be empathetic, to portray a character. Uh, so these are, these are all good things. And um, it's just really accepting that because our society, our media tends to portray a uniculture of we should all have the same values and, you know, have the same personalities, which I think is, uh, is actually not very healthy for us. Very well said. You know, I was thinking about several things as you were talking along. I was thinking about, you know, how leadership evolves. I was even, yeah, I'm not getting into politics by any means, but that's, <laughs> that's kind of where the mind goes when you're talking about Who's, who's running the tribe, you know, and then mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard to not think about it in current times. But, and then I was thinking about the, uh, the whole situation of uh, the importance and the relevance in athletic performance of guided imagery. Mm. Yeah, because in a way, if a person has an anxiety and then they start thinking about the negatives, anxiety can create a negative. Mm -hmm. And can create, you know, altered, uh, inappropriate, uh, falling off the bar, tripping on the run or whatever, mm -hmm. as opposed to really being synchronous and going over the bar and really having a sense of coordination and, and victory, you know, where you actually imagine that you can do that as opposed to living in the negative mind construct. Do you do, do, you do affirmations and guided imagery like that as well? Yes, in a way, um, one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best uh, types of imagery is something called WHOOP, uh, W-O-O-P. And if you go to whoopmylife.org, you can find out more information. I'm not associated with this. This is, <laughs> these are, this is a, a psychologist in New York, a researcher who's been studying um, some of the best ways to achieve goals. And, and I'll just actually summarize it really quickly. And I, I would do this with an athlete. So, for example, WHOOP is really stands for WISH. So let me, let me go through all the, the whole acronym. W is for wish, O is for outcome, the other O is for obstacles, and the P is for planning or if-then planning. So what we do is mm -hmm. we get, I get the athlete for, or whoever, a high achiever to close their eyes, and okay, what we come up with the wish. Wish is really just what you want to happen. I want to uh, win this, this game. Uh, 
okay, so you bring that to mind, and uh, then we think of um, uh, the the outcome, which is how great it's going to feel. Uh, then we get into that guided imagery, uh, all this you know, incorporating all the senses, uh, getting the person to imagine how good it's going to feel, what they're going to hear, what they're going to feel, uh, you know, in their body. What are they doing with their body? What are they uh, uh, seeing? All those things. And we get that to be as vivid as possible. And then we go over obstacles, which is all the things that can go wrong. And I think this is one of the places that a lot of um, mental skills trainer or sports psychologists go wrong is that they, they stick to just the pure positive. But mm -hmm. going over the obstacles, which is, okay, um, you know, I could be wrestling and feel like I'm getting really tired or I could be uh, distracted by the crowd and you go up, come up with all the things that could affect your performance. And then the last thing, P, is planning or if-then planning. So you say to yourself, okay, if I'm noticing that I'm distracted by the crowd, you know, I'm going to uh, slap my hands together to do basically bring my attention back to the present moment. Uh, if I'm feeling exhausted, I'm going to imagine, you know, how good it would feel to win, you know, uh, whatever it may be. And research shows that even just the last part, the P, the if-then planning, uh, people are about 300% more likely to achieve a goal just by doing if-then planning. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, this is my sort of fancy way of, uh, of doing imagery, uh, but incorporating, uh, you know, the, this just a bit more uh, research into it. One, one, one thing, you can think of astronauts, for example, they definitely do whoop, you know, before they go to outer space. Uh, mm -hmm. They go over every single possible mm -hmm. uh, obstacle and this possible solution. So when you're in the situation and you've already done, gone over whoop, in other words, every day you're going you're gonna to rehearse this, all the things that can happen, whether it's a long-term goal or whether it's, you know, the goal of this podcast, you know, what, mm -hmm. what, how you want it to go and what you want to do. But uh, what happens is you, you, when you're in a situation where you're stressed or tired, we go back to our old habits. So when you practice whoop, what happens is it automatically you do the things you plan to do. So it really saves you in a way uh, when things don't go as planned. It becomes automatic. It's not like an astronaut, uh, you know, they, they're like, oh, I'm too stressed. I can't decide. What do I do? There's a leak in the, in the shuttle. Uh, they just know what to do automatically because of whoop. So that's very interesting because what you're bringing in, and I think it's very good that you highlighted that because that is so true. So, and we've had some really interesting interviews here in Core Brain Journal, and, mm -hmm. and some of them do take the direction of affirmation. In fact, mm -hmm. I just read a Wall Street Journal apropos of what you're talking about, which I had no idea why this was in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and this is going to sound, speaking of whoop, it's going to sound a little woo woo what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> But they were really quite firm on the value of, of uh, mantra affirmations. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, just have, and they were actually spent a lot of time in the Wall Street Journal saying, here is a, va there is a value scientifically proven on a five, six word mantra. Mm -hmm. Like, in these situations, I rise to the occasion or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. just making something up. Yeah. But, the, but the point is that you have, a mindset that deals with a problem, yes. you know, and it's, and it's a built in mindset. And then you, when you say that it takes you into a different, more acceptable reality mm -hmm. in which you're actually coping with the reality that you're dealing with. And, and that's interesting because a lot of people uh, also come to me and say, look, I, there, you know, I want to have no doubts. I want to be fully confident and have no doubts in my abilities. And, and I usually give them a little lecture. I say, listen, let's just pretend I had a magic wand and I could erase that part of your, or I can destroy that part of your brain that gives you any doubts. And let's just see how good of an idea that is. Uh, so let's just say the Olympics are three months away and your alarm goes off at 5 a.m. to get up and train, but you don't have any doubts anymore. You're pretty convinced you're going to win. Now how motivated are you going to be to get up and train? Yeah. You just say, well, not so motivated, maybe. And I go, okay, how about your training? And you start to get sore and tired. And, uh, you know, how motivated are you going to be to train if you're pretty confident you're going to win? Well, not yeah, so motivated. <laughs> your whole aggression is going out the window. It That's reminds right. me of Muhammad Ali training mm -hmm. for what he was going to say to psych out his, part, his, his uh, uh, combatant before he even got in the ring. You yes. know, he was calling him names and, you know, <laughs> pimping his mother or whatever. 
And the guy came in and was just furious. And he was like, relax, because that person hadn't organized that game plan. Mm -hmm. And so he, he would, you know, sting like a bumblebee, whatever, buzz like a bumblebee, sting like a bee, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, it was really very interesting because he put the mindset into the preparation for the negative and actually created an adversity situation. Yeah. Well, and I actually think this is a societal problem. I see it clinically and I also see it, um, uh, you know, with, with high achievers and with just regular Joes. Uh, uh, so we live in a time in history where we have nothing but comfort. Uh, we don't need to experience extremes in temperature. We have air conditioning. We have furnaces. Uh, so we rarely experience any extremes in temperature compared to all of our history. Uh, we rarely experience true threats. We, there may be a lot of anxiety, but true threats are actually quite low relative to when we lived in, in the savannah or when we lived 100 years ago. Uh, there's much more threat of disease, uh, starvation. Um, you know, the economy was not so hot, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. We had a lot more uh, real threats. And I really think it's affected us as a society. We're a lot less hardy than we were before. And there's a real push in the subfield of what they call biohacking, which I realize I'm part of, which I didn't realize <laughs> until a couple of years ago. <laughs> Someone says, you're a biohacker. I said, oh, okay. But the, you know, you know, I'll just give you an example of a trend. So one trend is to expose yourself to heat and cold. Uh, and there's, you know, I'm not a physiologist, but there is research to suggest that being in hot saunas actually does a lot of good things for our bodies, uh, for our psyches. Uh, and I personally use a sauna about four mornings a week, but also cold exposure to cold. So, I mean, I wouldn't recommend running around in your underwears in the winter, but, uh, you know, a better way to do this would be uh, using, uh, like I do, I've, for about two years now, I've taken nothing but cold showers. And it seems crazy to people, but it really does boost your sense of self-efficacy because before you go in that shower, your mind inevitably pops up with thoughts like, this is going to be hell. <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> Why am I doing this? You, don't, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to handle this. Um, and it's too early. And we, you train yourself to be able to not get hooked by these thoughts and say, okay, thanks, mind. I know what you're doing. You're programmed to protect me. But you're like an overprotective mother. Sometimes you're overprotective and you're, you know, false alarming it. And you do it anyways. And this is the key, I think, is doing it despite how you feel. Uh, this is the key to success, I believe, in life. And you go in the shower, it feels uncomfortable, it's never as bad as you predicted, and at the end you feel good about it. It's the same thing with exercising. It's the same thing. But we live in such an environment that it's, we're so protected by not only physical pain, but also psychological pain. So when anything goes wrong or we feel any negative emotions, we feel like we need to, not, like we feel bad, we shouldn't have negative emotions because everybody, let's say on Facebook, looks like they're having a, a, a great old time and we're not so happy some days and maybe there's something wrong with me. But the reality is we all have these emotions and these are um, uh, part, and we're just, we really have an idea that we need to not feel pain. If we have any physical pain, we take Tylenol or ibuprofen um, and we mask all these things, including negative emotions. We run to the bottle, to the to cannabis, to television, to Facebook, to not feel pain. And that in the end actually costs us and makes us weaker. No question about it. Actually, you're, you're uh, again, driving at a point that I've always been fascinated by and, and, and reflecting on my own life. It's been mm -hmm. the painful events in my life which have really driven me forward to whatever next thing is going to happen because I actually faced that thing and I realized that thing and I've embraced it and I've got to do something else with it. You know, my mm -hmm. first book was based on a very painful professional experience with a guy that I had a lot of respect for it turned inside out. And I was like, okay, this is a difficult relationship. What am I going to make out of this thing? What, what can I do to understand it better? And it really pushed me down a lot of different avenues. It's a very useful point. Now I got to take a quick break here. This is a mm -hmm. great conversation. I can see I'm looking forward to talking more with you. And one of the things we have to do is take a break for our sponsors. What we're going to, we come back. I want to talk with you and take some time to talk about some of these other, uh, for one of a better expression, neurodiversity tools. I mean, we've talked about jumping in a cold shower. We talked about the value of hot, shower, uh, hot showers. 
I mean, <laughs> hot sauce, pardon me. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about where I'm going. <laughs> and, and the next thing, of course, is let's talk about those tools to measure these things that you know something about being a neuropsychologist. So we'll be back, folks, in just a minute. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families, including military families internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living. How do we know? We refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing. So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's d-h-a-l-a-b.com forward slash core. Okay, guys, welcome back. We had a little break there. Thanks for our sponsors. Now we're going to go back to talk to Chris and really hit this whole thing of what Dr. Friesen thinks is are tools that can actually help us measure some of these. And we haven't spent a lot of time at Core Brain Journal talking about tools. Yes, we've talked about laboratory tools. One of our sponsors is a laboratory. But going over into the other tools that neuropsychologists and others can use to measure and actually directly treat the brain, that's a much, it's a deeper subject. We're not going to be able to cover it in the rest of this interview. But let's touch a little bit on it, Chris, in terms of what you do as a professional, what you think has been valuable for you and, work, and people that you've worked with. Yes. So uh, one of the things I'm, I, I have board certification in uh, neurofeedback, um, which is a form of biofeedback that uh, is really uh, training brain waves, for lack of a better, uh, for a simple way of explaining it. And one of the things we do, ideally, it's expensive to get into it, but ideally is to do a quantitative EEG or uh, electroencephalograph um, before you start the training. And um, um, QEEGs are similar to the same basic equipment as uh, a neurologist or a sleep specialist would use, except the neurologist and sleep specialist is looking at the same waveforms, but they don't convert it to a normative database, which is a very psychology type thing to do. We, psychologists, because we have PhDs, we like to turn things into data uh, and normative data. Because, uh, you know, what does it mean if, you're, if you score 10 out of 20? Does that mean you're better than most people or worse than most people. And so this is why we need normative data to compare ourselves to others our age. So quantitative EEG takes the regular EEG and uh, basically puts it into a database and converts it to uh, a normative uh, measures. They're called Z-scores. And it, this is just how much deviation your uh, parts of your brain, how much they're deviating from a normative sample of you know, usually highly what we call clean individuals. So individuals with no history of anything. So it's, it's debatable whether they're 
normal uh, or not uh, because they're, they're, they're ultra clean. They have no history of any, never taking any depressants, you know, no mental health history, uh, no diseases, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Intelligence has to be about average, which by definition, therefore, it's missing chunks of the population. But uh, so what we do is you, you can do a quantitative EEG. It takes uh, about an hour to do, like, start to finish. You put a cap on. You, know, you put these electrodes on, 19 sites, and uh, it, you just sit there, close your eyes uh, for a few minutes, and open your eyes for a few minutes, and that's typically it. You don't feel anything because it's just measuring electricity uh, that's produced by your brain. And then we get these things called brain maps, which shows us if there's any areas of overactivity or underactivity. And there's a whole bunch of metrics pages and pages but to simplify it there there's metrics of how parts of the brain are communicating with each other etc and so what we can do is uh, look at that and see if there's uh, areas that correspond with symptoms and I'll give you a quick example I worked with a very high level athlete who uh, had problems it, it, not only in sport but also in the in their personal life with anxiety but on the QEG, they had a, a lot of excessive fast wave activity in the parietal lobes. Uh, and this individual sport involved uh, uh, basically a lot of spatial awareness in the parietal mm -hmm. lobes, uh, especially the right side, you know, contr controls that. And uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It makes, you know, I had to step back and wonder, well, do I want to train this down with neurofeedback uh, or but I could, which would probably reduce the anxiety, but it also may affect their, their visual spatial abilities. They may not be one of the best in the world anymore. So it, it can be a little, bit, a little bit of a dangerous thing in, in terms of someone's career. And so I really think that um, people who do neurofeedback and quantitative EEG need, need a lot of training, preferably a, a, a registered health professional, like a neuropsychologist, psychiatrist, neurologist, uh, who have a lot of training in the brain because you can do some damage um, if you train the wrong things. I'll stop there, but there's a lot more I can say, but I'll, I'll let you ask any more well, questions. Well, you, you, peaked, you peaked my interest. I'm sure everybody there is waiting with bated breath. What happened to the guy? What did you do? What was your resolution to that problem? Well, actually, interestingly enough, I have, we have, we're, this actually just happened uh, about So you're not ago. there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. That's right. I actually, what I did was consulted with one of the top experts in uh, sports psychology, neuropsychology, and quantitative EEG and neurofeedback named Leslie Sherlin. Uh, he's in California. I contacted him. And he actually, as we speak, he's actually reviewing uh, this. I said, look, I, I, I want to make sure. I don't make a mistake, and he's seen thousands and thousands and thousands of, of high-achieving uh, athletes, their QEEG brain maps. And, uh, I, I, you know, like, like, uh, like most people, we, we, it's always good to have a second opinion before mm -hmm. you tinker with something like that. And so I, I'm actually waiting to hear back, too. I think that we're not going to train it down. We're going to train it in a different way. Um, and, and, and this is the thing. When you get a quantitative EEG, pretty much everyone will show abnormality. It's like giving someone a personality measure. You don't, everyone doesn't score average on every dimension. Uh, people are going to have things, uh, you know, dimensions that are high, some that are low, some that are average. That's the same thing that happens when you do a quantitative EEG, and we have to be careful not to over-pathologize any findings. Um, I'll give you a quick example. My post posterior cingula is, you know, very, has a lot of beta, high beta activity, which is fast activity. That, um, that was really the only uh, abnormality, I guess you could say, on mine. But the question was, is this part of what makes me unique, that, that drives me, that makes me think quickly that, you know, uh, it, or is this, you know, a pathological thing? But the reality is I had no symptoms that corresponded with that area. And so mm -hmm. if there's no symptoms corresponding with the abnormalities on the brain map, we don't touch them. Um, well, that's interesting. Now, let me yeah. tell you, I know just a little bit compared to you about the posterior cingulate. Okay, so, the, mm -hmm. so what happens with the anterior cingulate is stuck on obsessional thinking. It doesn't necessarily have to have anxiety associated with it, but it's locked down in a certain respect. The good thing about having a nice hot posterior cingulate is you definitely don't have Alzheimer's. It's one of the first things to go. You know, when, right. you, when you look at a scan and that posterior cingulate is out then, and you have some other signs, it's like, okay, maybe <laughs> we're over in an, in an unpleasant place. So, but one of the things that, that I learned that we've seen and, and with the people we've worked with is it is a place for uh, memories that are in some level con conflictual perhaps, but are, and maybe not entirely resolved. 
Now, I'm not doing psychoanalysis with you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It's, you know, something to think about because it may not show as a cortical expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how deep those EEG goes, those QEGs actually go. Uh, you know, whether they, they show mainly cortex because yes. you're, you're looking at the surface. They do, and they go down to the, they go down between the uh, hemispheres. Um, you can get at the hippocampus to some extent as well. Is that right? But, but uh, not the, not really the subcortical regions, brainstem, you, you don't get that. It's really yeah. cortex. Um, um, yeah, you have to do something called uh, Loretta, which is a, yeah, basically Loretta, a yeah. 3D map um, that isn't perfect, but it's, 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 it's quite good. It can really pinpoint where is this, you know, come emanating from? Where is, where is this fast activity? Because if you just do a 2D map, it just shows it just near the top back of the head. But it, you, once you do the Loretta analysis, you can actually look at where is it coming from? from is it a uh, posterior singlet or is it actually on the surface so is it on the, pr mm -hmm. on the parietal lobe is where where is it coming from so it, it, it's this is i mean i really believe the future of psychiatry clinical psychology neuropsychology is neuromodulation mm -hmm. i don't and when oh. i say that yeah I, I don't mean that psychotherapy is going to go to the wayside psychotherapy will always be extremely mm -hmm. important i i think that uh this the neuromodulation is uh, going to be uh, either equal to uh, pharmaceuticals in the sense of how uh, frequently they are used and how accessible they are. Um, but I think all three have a very strong role. They they attack the brain in a way at a different levels, and uh, I, I, I I think we're in a really exciting time right now when it comes to uh, especially individuals with clinical difficulties. Um, the, the, the neuromodulation, for example, neurofeedback, uh, is, is really uh, changing the game, I believe. Well, let's take just a minute because I'm sure a number of people are, I'm going to just, uh, I know some of these answers, of course, but I want you to elaborate on them. Mm -hmm. Number one is when you put that cap on and you got the electrodes in, they're not sticking needles in your skin. No. They're electrodes on the surface. That's right. They, they do, we do, do use a blunt needle. So you'll see somebody's a picture that looks like someone's sticking a needle into someone's head. They're just squirting the gel, the uh, conductive solution, into the, the little holes. So, no, there's no, there's no needles to the head. It's, just, it's like a swim cap with a bunch of holes in it. But the biggest side effect is you get some goo in your hair when you're done. Yeah. <laughs> and the next point is, I think it'd be good if you could just take a moment to explain what actually happens with neurofeedback. You know, with biofeedback, it can be breathing and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. With neurofeedback, tell our listeners what actually happens and how you actually, like for example, with that athlete you're talking about, bring, if you're going to bring some of that down a little bit, how do you actually do that? Well, how does that tool actually work? Sure, sure. So the the, the quantitative EEG gives us a map to start with. So we don't just train everyone the same because uh, you can, you know, train up alpha, which is sort of a relaxation, meditative type state. But if someone has excessive alpha, uh, that's actually not good. Uh, alpha is a part when your brain is actually in idling mode, it's actually not really doing anything. Um, it's good at times, uh, but not all the time. So neurofeedback, so if we find an abnormality, let's just say, for example, with attention deficit disorder, excuse me, um, uh, the majority tend to have excessive slow wave activity, which is usually theta or alpha, uh, in the frontal lobes. And essentially, uh, this represents an underactivation or hypoperfusion, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so the training, so if you find that on a QEEG and the person does describe you having ADHD symptoms and they're diagnosed with that, we can uh, train that up. So they, they look at a screen. We don't do the full cap anymore. We may just use one to four elect, uh, electrodes are called sensors that uh, stick to your scalp. And you basically play a video game or watch a movie and the movie or the game doesn't go forward unless your brain's in the correct state. So in this circumstance would be to reduce the amount of slow wave activity, which you know, correspondingly increases the activity of that part of the brain. It's sort of a double negative, but we reduce slow or inhibit slow wave activity. It speeds up that activity in the front part of the brain. So it's a form of, it's, it's based on neuroplasticity. So you need to do something again and again, uh, usually twice a week for a minimum of about 20 sessions uh, to get any improvement. So you can compare it to a physical exercise program where if you worked out once or twice, it's not going to really do anything. You got to work out a couple days a week for, you know, a few months uh, to get an effect. Uh, and the difference though with working out is 
with the neurofeedback, you're basically putting your brain into states that it doesn't normally go into. So when we're measuring the QEEG, they're at rest and their brain is just not producing a lot of activity or the opposite, they're too much fast activity. And this is what it's doing. And so what we're doing is it's as if with uh, ADHD with slow wave activity, it's as if there is a brick underneath the gas pedal. And what we're doing is slowly chipping away at that brick to make it smaller and smaller. So the gas pedal can now go all the way down and all the way up. So it's really building mental flexibility. So when the situation calls for it, for example, you're in school, uh, listening to a teacher or you're at your job or you have to study some boring material, you can uh, make your brain focus, in other words, uh, you know, decrease the theta activity um, at will. And so this is really what happens. And a lot of the time, if you do a post-test quantitative EEG, you'll see that the slow wave activity is actually decreased. So that's good. Uh, or uh, sometimes there's not much of a difference, but there's a behavioral difference because now the person has flexibility. They can kind of turn it on and off at will. So that's sort of the, the best way to explain it, I think. And so the training, let's take a little more and get a little more of a magnifying glass out so <laughs> listeners who don't know what neurofeedback is. I mean, there are a lot of people here that know exactly what it is, but I think just to embrace the entire audience a little <laughs> bit, the the, uh, you know, my experience with neurofeedback is you're actually watching a monitor, a screen, mm -hmm. and you yes. see that screen and there are activities on the screen that are in fact doing different things that are related to the pickups on your brain that translate it to the feed. So the picture itself is modified by what you're actually doing with your brain waves. And on some levels, you actually try to guide that screen around not by touching anything, but by actually thinking about things in different ways. Yes, yes. And, and there's, there's some debate in the field about how much of it is conscious and how, mu how much of it is not conscious in the sense of um, sometimes the harder you try, let's say you have fast, a lot of high beta activity. So in other words, parts of your brain are overactivated. The harder you try to make, let's say, the car move in the video game, so the car won't move if the beta is high, it will move only when you reduce that activity. So uh, the harder you try, the higher the beta goes, the more the car doesn't move. And so you really have to let go and allow the car mm -hmm. to move. So a, a lot of people will say, and I, I, see, I tend to agree with this to a certain extent, is that you just – you don't even have to want uh, to improve. Uh, you look at the screen, your brain wants the car to move or wants the movie to continue to play and not pause or the volume to stay up and not you know, go into mute or the screen to fade or not fade. Mm -hmm. You just, your brain wants that even beyond a conscious level. It's just a more pleasure, pleasurable experience. So it's going to learn on its own without conscious awareness to, to, to do that. So uh, that's one really neat thing about neurofeedback is, is some individuals, um, they, uh, they, 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 they don't want to do psychotherapy, for example. So if people have depression or anxiety, and neurofeedback is a good alternative option. I don't think it fully replaces psychotherapy, but I do think uh, for some individuals, it is a great option. So it, it's, it's interesting how it works, and it's still an evolving field. Chris, thank you so much. You know, uh, we haven't really touched the surface in a conversation we need to have. There were some other tools that came up. There are some other things. I mean, as a little bit of a tease, we're going to have you back with your permission, of course. Mm -hmm. I would like to talk about some of those other tools. And I think what you do with athletes, what you do with entrepreneurs who are stuck, that's very, very interesting because so many of us, myself included, have been stuck in our lives <laughs> trying to find some answers of where do we go, what do we do, and thanks that we have professionals like yourself who can say, look, you don't have to be stuck anymore. In fact, uh, a good buddy of mine, Tom Brown at Yale, wrote a book that was really basically on brain stuckness <laughs> mm. as a measure of attention deficit disorder actually the new phrase is executive function disorder i mean people adhd is a is an appearance term and it's really kind of outdated mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. you know and he's and he's written a book about you know being stuck so uh with that chris what we're going to do is tease them let's say a couple things about some of these other topics that we may get into in the future. I haven't prepared you for this. So, you know, let's go back to that talk we had a little bit, if you don't mind, and say a couple of words, and then we'll wind it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, other neuromodulation strategies. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of uh, interesting things out there. We'll just, I'll just briefly touch upon them. Uh, one is uh, 
cranial electrotherapy stimulation, or CES. There's a device called AlphaStim. In the United States, you need a prescription. In Canada, you don't. Um, this has been shown with to helpful be helpful with anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. depression, and insomnia. Transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, is uh, very rarely used clinically. Uh, it's got a lot of research, especially with depression. Um, uh, there's another, the newest thing is transcranial photobiomodulation, which is using infrared light. Uh, uh, you wear a little helmet thing, infrared light goes up your nose to get to the prefrontal cortex, and you wear a little cap on your head, and this affects the mitochondria. And preliminary work that's happening is suggesting uh, very strong responses to individuals with dementia, for example, full-blown Alzheimer's disease, uh, etc. Research is showing that it's helpful once you're using it, as you're using it, but the, if you stop using it, the effects start to wear off. But this is, um, these are just a couple of examples of other neuromodulation strategies that I think are uh, going to be, get more and more... Uh, um, research, attention. yeah, Pay attention, yeah, and, and and people are going to start looking for these uh, to do to to help themselves. Well, that last one is very interesting because I have a friend up in D.C. who does near infrared hemoencephalography, oh, which yes. blows a near infrared beam right through the skin and through the cranium and has some uh, very positive effects. So we can talk about all this, and I look. Very much forward to having you back, Dr. Chris Friesen. And by the way, let's close with where people can reach you. We're going to have it on the show notes, but where people can reach you and talk about, we're going to have uh, the book Achieve available as a uh, download possibility. It's not a download, but it would be a drawing possibility. It'll be open mm -hmm. for two weeks from the time this is published. Thank you very much, Chris, for, for offering that up. So tell us where we can reach you. Uh, the best place is uh, FriesenPerformance.com. Uh, I have a newsletter there. I post things on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter is fr at FriesenPerform. Um, most of those, they're a combination of brain things, but uh, a lot of the performance side. Niagara neuropsychology.com is my more clinical site that a lot of the stuff we're talking about. I have information there. I have links to various studies and summary research. Um, you know, that'd be a great place to, to, to look if you're interested in that. So those are the best places to catch me. Thank you so much for taking the time. What an interesting conversation. You know, talking with a guy like you gives a lot of people a lot more hope because, hey, there are some things we can do. This is not just imagination. You're, you're talking from, brain, biology, and, and a really fresh, new, engaging reality. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.